Hi, I'm Rob. Tale number two, Hoop Dreams. When I was a kid, I was obsessed with basketball. I would practice literally every single day. I had these tapes that were made by Pete Maravich called Pistol Pete's Homework Basketball, and they had these drills, and I would do them all the time. My dad still talks about looking outside and seeing me doing these drills in the rain. I was very committed. I would set my alarm so I could get some shooting in before school. And then it was the first thing I did when I got home from school. And also, it's what I did with my friends. We played all the time. And I got pretty good. I wasn't actually good at basketball, but in my neighborhood, when playing with friends, I was pretty good. And for a while, basketball was really fun. And the natural thing to do was join a basketball team. Where I lived in Virginia, you could join a recreational league when you were in fourth grade. That was the first year. And I signed up and quickly realized playing basketball on a team in front of people was very different than playing in your driveway. During games, I became so nervous that I could barely function. I had a hard time paying attention. When I got the ball, it didn't seem like I could do anything that I was able to do when I was playing alone or with my friends. And I quickly grew to hate it. But at the same time, I still really wanted to play basketball. I wanted to overcome whatever was happening. And so began the vicious cycle of practicing all week and really looking forward to our game on the weekend, hoping that through repetition, the nerves would go away and I would be unlocked and be the player I was when I was practicing. So looking forward to a game all week, and then when the game finally comes, feeling absolutely awful. Call it nerves, call it anxiety, call it shyness. Stage fright? Who knows? So my first season playing basketball was not fun, but I got through it. I made it very clear to the coaches that I would appreciate it if they never put me in the game, but they did, and every second I was playing was a nightmare. I was a terrible teammate. I was obsessed with not having the ball passed to me. I just wanted it to be over. And then the season ended, and I went back to playing basketball alone every day, I still loved it, and when the next season rolled around, I signed up again. This time was different, though. I had a coach that understood my struggle. He could see it. His name was Coach Zimbo, and he made it his personal mission to help me overcome my problem. His methods felt harsh, but he always checked in with me to make sure that this is the path I wanted to go down. His plan was exposure. He would put me in as many uncomfortable situations as he could, and eventually I would stop feeling terrible and be able to perform at the level that I wanted to. His plan for me included three things. In practice, he would create situations where everyone was watching me play basketball. So for maybe 10 minutes of each practice, he would have everyone stop but me and have everyone watch me do layups or shoot or whatever. He wanted them to be like a crowd, so if I did good, they would clap. It wasn't like they were passively standing there. They were paying attention to me and reacting to what I did. And then in games, he would just play me as much as he could. He actually played me the entire game for the first few games, which was a violation of the rules. No player was allowed to play the entire game, but we were losing, so he didn't really care, and he kept me in the whole time. The third thing he did was we had these team meetings every Friday night at one of the other players' houses who had a gigantic TV, and we would review game tape from the previous week's game and then talk about the strategy for our next game. And during those meetings, he would make a point to include a lot of me in the game tape we were reviewing because he knew that would make me uncomfortable. Even now, it seems like a great plan. I mean, what else can you really do? And I'm really grateful that he put in so much effort to help me. Nobody else had done that up to that point, and it was really nice. But it didn't work. That bad feeling that I had in games, it got worse. And since I was feeling it more because I was in games for so long, it really wore me down. There was no escape. And then I started to feel awful in practice too. So instead of having this 
week of anticipation and then going to a game and it being really negative. You could say I was going through that cycle once a week. I was now going through the cycle several times a week. And it's all I thought about all the time. But as it's happening, and I'm sure this was true for Coach Zimbo too, it's hard to know if you're doing the right thing or the wrong thing. Because part of this plan was that I would feel very uncomfortable for a while before I started to feel comfortable. So we just kept doing it. And I kept feeling worse and worse. And then it all came to a head in our seventh game of the season. There was a big crowd there that day. My mom, my brother, and my sister were there. I was on the court in the game. I felt bad, but not especially bad. And then like a switch flipped inside of me. And I had to escape. I had to get out of the game. And I walked over to Coach Zimbo and I said, please take me out. And he said no. So I ran back in, kept playing, and again, was just overcome by the thought that I had to escape. I had to get out of there. So I went to him again and said, I really need you to take me out. And he said, are you sick? And I said, yeah, I'm sick. And he said, what's wrong? I said, my stomach hurts. And he said, I don't believe you. And I said, no, my stomach, it really hurts. I'm going to throw up. And he was right. My stomach did not hurt. He said, if you want to come out of the game, you have to fall down on the floor and get them to stop the game for medical reasons and take you out that way. I'm not just going to pull you out of the game. So I went back in and I was weighing the options. This nervousness, this anxiety, was all about being watched. That's what I didn't like. So it's very strange that I would make a decision that guaranteed all eyes in the building would be on me. I walked out into the middle of the court and dramatically kicked my feet out from under myself and collapsed onto the floor. The ref blew the whistle. The gym went totally silent. Someone screamed, call 911. I remember my brother yelled back, don't call 911, he's fine. He knew. The ref came over and knelt by me and asked me if I was okay. I said, it's my stomach, and I was pretending I was having just intense stomach pain, and they took me out of the game. Even then, the coach wanted me to stay. Stay on the bench, watch the rest of the game, don't worry about it. But I wanted to leave, so we went home. It felt like the end, and I was embarrassed and sort of devastated. But there was also this huge sense of relief at the prospect that I might never have to do that again. But Coach Zimbo wasn't going to give up so easily. He called me that night, let me know again that it was no big deal, that I didn't need to worry about it. He said he knew that I was lying, but he didn't care. And when I started talking to him, I guess he could hear like a hesitancy in my voice. He could tell I was considering quitting the team. And he really did not want that to happen. He asked me to give him at least one more shot, come to one more practice, and if I wanted to quit after that, he understood. So I said okay. He wanted me to get to practice 30 minutes early, and him and his son, who was our assistant coach, they were there waiting on me. And it was really friendly and pressure-free. We just shot around and socialized, basically. And then he left the gym and came back with this framed poster. He said his dad had given it to him, and it was hanging in his office at his house. At first I thought he was giving it to me, but that wasn't the case. He just wanted me to see it, and he wanted to read it out loud to me. It was a poem by Edgar Albert Guest called Don't Quit. It's kind of long, but I'm going to read it. When things go wrong, as they sometimes will, when the road you're trudging seems all uphill, when the funds are low and the debts are high, and you want to smile, but you have to sigh. When care is pressing you down a bit, rest if you must, but don't you quit. Life is queer with its twists and turns, as every one of us sometimes learns. And many a failure turns about when he might have won had he stuck it out. Don't give up, though the pace seems slow. You may succeed with another blow. Often the goal is nearer than It seems to a faint and faltering man. Often the struggler has given up when he might have captured the victor's cup, and he learned too late when the night slipped down how close he was to the golden crown. Success is failure turned inside out, the silver tint of clouds of doubt, and you never can tell how close you are. It may be near when it seems so far. So stick to the fight when your heart is hit. 
it's when things seem worst that you must not quit. And that's it. And it had what felt like an instant, profound impact on me. And then practice that night was great. I wanted him to stop for 10 minutes and put all the attention on me, like we had been doing. I was recharged to overcome this thing. And I felt pretty good. I think just the act of showing up after such a catastrophic failure boosted my confidence a little bit. And then Friday rolled around, and it was time for the team meeting. My mom was driving me there. I remember turning into the neighborhood where we were going, and it hit me that we would be reviewing game tape, and that I might have to watch my collapse with all of my teammates. It's so interesting how you can, just in a split second, go from being one person to another person. We were riding in the car, and if you could stop time and go backwards, and the car moved back 20 feet, that Rob that was sitting in the car was really looking forward to the team meeting. He was excited about the practice he had just had, and he was excited for the game that weekend. And then in just a matter of a few seconds, or in the time that it took the car to move 20 feet, I was a totally different person, and all I could think about was getting out of there. I had to escape. I convinced my mom to turn around and go back home. And I never played in another basketball game again. Rob Tells Tales is produced by me, Rob Tiffin. I had some additional editing help from Ben Lamb. The cover art is by Marcella Johnson. She also came up with the title. The end credits music is by Poddington Bear. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, and at robtellstales.com. This podcast would have not been possible without Ben, Marcella, and Melanie. Thank you, and thanks for listening. Thank you.